Next up, after lunch here, is some science, but I don't think you're gonna be put to sleep because it's science that really has to do with our winter, last winter. And we're gonna start with some theory and we're gonna move into more and more specifics of practice and decision making. And so our first speaker, Jason Konigsberg, um, is a forecaster for the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Um, he's been a patroller in Park City, a patroller in various places in Utah. Um, but he did some research last year on uh, how to uh, predict how to uh, do avalanche forecasting with a deep slab, deep persistent slab problem. And uh, after he came up with his paper for the avalanche review, I actually circulated it to some of our local forecasters before it even went to print in the avalanche review, like, hey, this is really useful. You guys might want to have a look at this. So uh, yeah, Jason, your work was super useful for us and we're psyched to have you, Jason. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, you summed it up really well. You could knock five minutes off of my talk there. <laughs> but uh, it was funny. Uh, there was an uh, email that went out beforehand talking about, you should stay behind the podium. You're going to block the screen. But I don't think I've ever blocked the screen in my life. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll start off with a quick story. And um, this is coming from a forecaster's perspective. But I mean, I know I haven't been forecasting for that long. And before I started forecasting, it was really interesting to, to know the process of, of how the, I was in Utah at the time, of how the forecasters came about getting to avalanche danger. So hopefully you guys will find this interesting. Um, it was January of two, 2016, and the CAIC, we have a monthly staff meeting every month. That's how monthly staff meetings work. <laughs> and um, we have 20 forecasters throughout the state between backcountry forecasters and highway forecasters. We're all meeting in Gunnison, Colorado. And we start off the meeting, we go around the room, and we talk about the state of the snowpack and the current backcountry avalanche danger. So the current situation, we're in the middle of high pressure. Um, we haven't had any avalanches in a long time. But the snowpack structure is still a little scary. It's Colorado, right? We still have a pretty good uh, depth horror layer at the bottom. We're even getting propagation and snowpack tests. And the avalanche danger has been moderate for a while. So we go around the room, 20 aval professional avalanche forecasters, and ask everyone, what do you think the avalanche danger is? And believe it or not, half said moderate and half said we should be at low right now. And I was in the moderate camp. I'm like looking at the snowpack. I'm like, no way. This is, I mean, look at that depth core layer. And um, so after that meeting, I went out looking for more information. And this is how this uh, project came about. So first off, thanks to my co-authors, uh, Spencer Logan. He did a lot of statistical, statistical research. And thanks a lot to Ethan, a good mentor. And you got the, the videos rolling, right? Good mentor. All right, great. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, really, uh, I didn't know when I was coming to the CAIC I'd be pursuing a master's degree, but uh, Ethan's been great. I'm just kidding. I'm not pursuing a master's degree. And, um, but a really great uh, advisor when it came to this project. So we all learned in our first avalanche classes, right, that persistent slab avalanches can happen weeks, months, um, you know, after a week layer is buried. And that's certainly true. But... Um, can they still occur if we're not loading this weak layer? Can we still have avalanches uh, seven days after a loading event, 14 days after a loading event? So these are questions that I wanted to answer. Uh, so simple goals of this project, when do persistent slab avalanches uh, occur related to loading events? And is there a point in time following a loading event when these avalanches no longer occur? So why do we want to study this? Um, these are statistics from Colorado. Uh, you can see most avalanche fatalities in Colorado um, are due, and th sorry, these are uh, eight winners, and this is the eight winners I studied, uh, are due to persistent weak layer avalanches. So this is, this is persistent slabs, deep persistent slabs, um, any persistent weak layer, not just depth toward the ground. Um, why do you want to know this in Wyoming? Uh, you know, talking to Bob Comey, and you know, you, you guys have a continental snowpack a lot in different ranges, whether it's the uh, eastern slope of the Wyoming range or Togety Pass. So just because um, the Teton may have a deeper snowpack at times doesn't mean you're getting away with not having a continental snowpack certain times of the year or certain places. Um, and in Colorado, we talk about this persistent slab problem in about 80% of our forecasts. So something we forecast for a lot and warn the public about, so really important to us. 
Uh, take you through one more scenario of why I'm studying this. Um, this is Summit County, Colorado. You can clearly see the layer of depth hole at the bottom of the snowpack in December 8th, 2015, and it started snowing. This isn't really a great snow picture, but it's a great picture of a stop sign in Montezuma, Colorado. <laughs> so we got one to two feet of snow. Uh, this was actually quite an easy forecast. Bumped in danger to considerable, put up a special avalanche advisory, and start warning the public we're gonna see some avalanches. So considerable danger, natural avalanche is possible, human triggered avalanche is likely, right? And that's what we got, one to two feet of snow, lots of avalanches. <clears throat> so a week later, we drop, you know, these, this, um, the avalanche activity quickly tails off, you guys have all seen this before, and we drop the danger to moderate. The forecaster says, it remains possible to trigger a large persistent avalanche today, but now we're almost a week from our last snowfall and loading event, the likelihood of triggering a persistent slab avalanche is decreasing. Moderate danger, still dangerous avalanche, possible to trigger, but we're not seeing natural avalanches anymore. So let me quickly explain this graph. You have the time on the bottom. Uh, December 23rd is when it snowed. Uh, the blue bar indicates snowfall, 11 inches of snowfall on December 23rd. And then the storm quickly tailed off, and so did our avalanche danger. Uh, so the storm ends Christmas Eve, and then the last avalanche in the period uh, was December 30th. And before December 30th, the, av the avalanche activity was really infrequent, so it went to a moderate danger. And then this is the period that um, I'm kind of really interested in studying, and this is when our uh, uncertainty as forecasters really increases. We're not getting any of these signs of uh, avalanche activity, and, that, and the, the snowpack isn't talking to us anymore. Maybe we're not getting collapsing or whomping, and um, this is what we wanted to look at. So now this is January 10th. Remember, the storm ended on uh, December 24th, so this is about 17 days later. We finally dropped the danger to low, and the forecaster says, it's now been over two weeks since our last significant snow event, no reports of natural avalanche activity since the Christmas storm cycle, and very few reports of avalanche activity. So it took us 17 days to drop to low. And my question is, could we have dropped the danger earlier? Um, here's the current situation. We did still have some propagation and snowpack tests. The structure wasn't great, but there was no recent avalanche activity, and it's been two weeks since the loading event. Uh, so there's been a lot of research on uh, forecasting for deep slabs before. Um, a, lot of, uh, a good bit of it has come out of Jackson Hall here. And my research is different. Uh, some of this past research, we want to like, it's looking at when are these deep slab avalanches going to occur? We're trying to pinpoint uh, this avalanche occurrence and look at these different weather factors. I just want to know when they're not gonna, going to occur. And I'm just really keeping it real simple, just looking at um, avalanches versus loading events. So I started off with a little area in Colorado to start this research. And then uh, after Seesaw last year, I expanded it with the help of my coworkers to a bunch of different zones in Colorado. So this is about as far as I got. <laughs> I had to call on the troops. So uh, this is when Spencer came to the rescue and uh, got behind the computer. And we found we had uh, 12,700 reported avalanches and eight winners. Uh, we filtered them out, and what we want to do is just get persistent slab avalanches. We were left with about 1,800 avalanches. And you're probably looking at that um, thinking, well, that's not a lot of persistent slab avalanches. And, these are, and the reason is these are just avalanches that we can confirm. So there's definitely quite a few more uh, persistent slab avalanches, but we just want to go with the sure things here. Um, and then we paired all these avalanches with wind and snow data across the state. So here's a coworker digging a... Uh, uh, crown profile and an avalanche cross from Arapaho Basin. This is near I-70 in Colorado in the Northern Mountains, uh, near the Eisenhower tunnel, tunnel as well. And uh, so we looked at this avalanche, uh, Arapaho Basin across the street there gave us weather data, and we took snow tail data for snow. Arapaho Basin gave us wind data. And we did this for all 1,800 avalanches. We looked at uh, snow and wind data and compared it to when these avalanches occurred. <clears throat> so this is a snow tail map. This is just an example of some of the data we gathered uh, for this one avalanche. So what I had to do next was uh, define a loading event. And in Colorado, uh, we often see avalanches with small amounts of snow. So quite a small uh, threshold for a loading event, just four inches in a day. But uh, these snow tail sites are kind of below tree line and not in starting zone. So if we get four inches at a snow tail site, oftentimes we'll have six, eight, 12 inches up above. So that's why it's a small amount, um, or six inches in consecutive days. Now we also included wind loading into this project recently, and um, we had a 
how cool the video's working. We had to um, pick a threshold for wind loading, and it was really tight criteria because we didn't want to capture too much. Otherwise, um, if we just went with windy days in Colorado every day in, in Colorado in the winter, it would be a loading day. So three hours of 20 to 40 mile an hour winds, and uh, oops, three hours of 20 to 40 mile an hour winds, and it had to have snowed the day before. So that's how we got a loading event from wind. So here are the results. Bar graphs after lunch, pretty exciting. <laughs> but, uh, let me explain this a little bit. Uh, so on the bottom is a day since a loading event. And on the, uh, the left or the y-axis, we have the amount of avalanches, and this is over eight winters. So if we look at uh, zero days since a loading event, that's a, that's a storm day pretty much, and probably not surprising to anyone, we see a lot of avalanches, 450 avalanches out of eight days, or sorry, eight winters. Now the next thing that caught my eye was um, the amount of avalanches we had more than seven days after a loading event, right? So this, remember a loading event's only four inches of snow or 20 to 40 miles an hour uh, winds. So 30, 300 avalanches, seven days past a loading event. That's, that's pretty scary. <laughs> and that's a lot of avalanches, 300 out of 1,800. So, and you see down, further down that graph there, we have avalanches occurring more than three weeks from a loading event. Uh, here's a, I started looking at these avalanches way out on the graph, um, 23, 24 days from a loading event. And what we saw, we started seeing was around these avalanches, there were small amounts of snowfall. So all these blue bars indicate snowfall and the red indicates avalanches. So is these small amounts of snow that aren't triggering a loading event in my study, but they are triggering avalanches. So th this is an old picture, so it's a little fuzzy. But uh, this is just like two inches stacked on one inch, stacked on two inches, and we get these big avalanches. So this is pretty interesting to me that way out from these loading events, we're getting these big avalanches. So I want to study that some more. Um, 300 out of 1,800 avalanches after seven days, and a lot of these avalanches are due to incremental loading, or so I think, but I had to look into it a little further. So were these avalanches, such as this one, um, were they due to incremental loading? How can we take snow out of the picture? What I did was I started looking at uh, avalanche activity during high pressure periods, or periods with no snowfall at all. So after seven days without snowfall, and this is, picture this as the same graph, but, but this is high pressure periods. So uh, the first day after a storm, or sorry, during a storm, 750 avalanches over eight winters. The next day, uh, no snowfall, but still a lot of avalanches. So as you'd expect, a lot of avalanches in the first few days of high pressure, but once we get to seven days of high pressure and no snowfall, it drops off uh, quite quickly. And now instead of 300 avalanches, we only have 122 avalanches. Um, and then there's no avalanches way out in the per period of high pressure. So in Colorado, we get these long periods of high pressure. You guys call them droughts, we call it winter. <laughs> um, and this is just comparing again to the first graph, so quite a big difference. So here's another chart. It's kind of the same one, but um, it's a pie, pie chart. I heard you guys in Wyoming like pie charts, so I try to switch it up. Um, so it's just a good representation. Out of 1,800 avalanches, uh, seven, or sorry, six, like 1,700 of them are happening within the first seven days of no snowfall or high pressure. Um, so I, you know, we have all this, uh, in Colorado, we have great uh, studies around unfortunately, avalanche fatalities, but that's where some of our uh, best data is because a person goes out and goes to look at an avalanche after we have a fatality, they study the, the snow, and not only do we look at the weather data, but we analyze the weather data. So this is really the best place to uh, get data and study when avalanche fatalities uh, occur related to loading events. So this was like the last thing I did in this study. And here's what I got. So out of 30 fatal avalanche accidents, uh, in Colorado on persistent weak layers over eight winters. 29 of them occurred within seven days of a loading event, and only one occurred seven days after a loading event. And even in that one occurrence, uh, the uh, avalanche accident investigator said, well, there's wind-drifted snow, and, you know, but it, it, didn't, it didn't meet my criteria, but there was still loading going on. So almost even in Colorado, like one of the worst snowpacks in the country, uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, a lot of avalanches and a lot of accidents are happening within seven days of a loading event. So, uh, summing it up, 
and kind of circling back around, try to answer these original two questions in the beginning of the presentation, um, we want to know, do persistent slab avalanches happen 7, 14 days after a loading event? Well, they do, but it seems like uh, incremental loading or small loads play a big part in these avalanches. Whereas if we have no snowfall at all and we have high pressure, um, then they occur much less frequently. And then uh, as far as fatalities, almost all of the accidents in Colorado occurred within seven days of a loading event. So how can we use this information practically? I could have skipped to this slide and skipped the first 30, but. <laughs> Uh, incremental loading contributes to persistent slab avalanches, and what does this mean to us? For me, whether I'm forecasting or I'm going out on a day off um, skiing in the backcountry or snowmobiling, I'm paying attention, when we have a weak snowpack, I'm paying attention to two inches, three inches, little, little loads. That's, I'm, it's really catching my eye now, and this study um, really brought my attention to that fact. Um, education should emphasize the most dangerous times, uh, which are you know, we, we talk about uh, loading events and we talk about storms being dangerous, but, but look, at, look at where people were, were killed there. It's right near loading events. And even the chart I showed you, when I looked through this data, it was, I mean, these were big storms and it's two, three, four days. So uh, the graph I showed you didn't even do it justice, but people are, are in Colorado even with our horrible snowpack are getting killed really close to storms. Um, so education should emphasize the most dangerous times. And, uh, you know, we don't want to de-emphasize these times out, as I, as I talked about, these times seven days from a loading event when we have small loads, but uh, this is something to keep in mind. And looking at the timing of persistent slab avalanches relating to loading events, this is more, um, you know, from a forecasting point of view, this could help us to understand the probability of avalanches occurring. So now we look at this chart again, and I'll loosely refer to this as high pressure periods instead of, I didn't really look at the barometer, but um, days without snowfall. So is, is this time, and it's more of a discussion question, but is this time, seven days in, or eight days without snowfall, is this a low avalanche danger? This is not something, you know, if you, going back to the original example uh, where we waited 17 days to go to low, um, was that the right move? And it's, a, it's a question mark. Um, certainly, when we talk about Avalanche is becoming unlikely, that certainly seems the case. Out of 1,800 avalanches, uh, very few happen, you know, eight, nine, ten days out. And, but the thing is, and, and this is an important point for, for uh, all the backcountry recreationalists in here, even if we are at low in danger, uh, when there's persistent weak layers buried in the snowpack, um, we can never say with certainty that the probability is at zero. There might be a really, really small chance, but, you know, going to an extreme, extreme terrain, uh, your probability of triggering an avalanche is never at zero. Uh, so I want to thank all the contributors, uh, all my staff contributed to this uh, presentation of this project, uh, all the Colorado Ski Patrols, all the backcountry users that submit observations, all the observations that are submitted really uh, help to build this database, and uh, my coworkers. So thank you very much. Jason, that's super helpful. And oh, Drew's already got his hand up. <laughs> Drew's got a question for you. All right. <laughs> Hi, Drew. <laughs> So are you saying because there's more people out during certain times, is that what your, yeah, the question is? Yeah, looking beyond uh, seven or eight days, you get like two inches. Right. You know, and you see sort of a bump. Mm -hmm. you know, like you're also seeing probably more skiers out there. Right. Uh, that's definitely a possibility. I mean, it's hard to say because we, didn't, we don't have numbers on the amount of people in the backcountry for each given day. Um, you know, 
Yeah, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. I, I think uh, an important study and you know things we're looking at is trying to gauge how many people are are out on these days. Um, you know, when there's moderate danger, consider we don't know the, the answers to those questions. I don't know if I answered your question at all, but. <laughs> Thank you. Bob's got a question for you. Yeah. A great study. Thanks. Um, I guess my question as a forecaster and forecasting the areas with multiple uses, um, this seven day period with no snowfall, this in wheat layer, um, and the trigger being, uh, can you speak to anything or not about a trigger being a, a, the way of one person versus a, a big play? Um, yeah, I think, you know, we've probably all seen that uh, snowmobiles can have a higher propensity to trigger deeper weak layers. So, um, you know, as a, as a forecaster, this is something we have to keep in mind. And, you know, this, this, uh, the, I think some of uh, what I've done has been a little bit misinterpreted interpreted in that I'm not trying to say that, um, you know, seven or eight days that uh, there's, there's no avalanche danger. And, you know, you should listen, you know, for the people out here, they should listen to their local avalanche center because we're taking much more into consideration. This is just one little, uh, one, one small factor, and this is something that um, I felt it was useful to me to add to snowpack tests and um, other signs of, of, or lack of activity. One more question. Sure, sure. Uh, so just to repeat the question, um, it was a really good question asking about certain spikes in the graph. You have a good eye. Um, I think the eight-day thing, and you know, we do have errors in our data entry. It's uh, human, human entered, and um, one of the fields in when you enter an uh, avalanche into our system is uh, you put a date, and then you could put estimated date or known date, and we really didn't distinguish between those. We didn't break that down further. So um, I know uh, one, one particular spike was one person uh, saw a huge natural avalanche cycle, entered 50 avalanches, and that was a reason for one of the spikes, but it was a really, really good question and good eye. Great, Jason. I, I really like the distinguishment between uh, incremental loading and high pressure, and that uh, that's given me something to pay attention to in my personal forecasting. You know, because when I go out, I'm taking Bob's forecast and then turning them into a nowcast for where I am, and that will influence where I'm going to go and what I'm going to do. And that makes me bring it in a little bit if I've had incremental loading. So thanks, Jason. Super interesting. <laughs> Thank you.